What we're doing today is we're holding an annual event called the Day in the Trenches. Uh, today we're hoping that the visitors who come here get an experience of how the soldiers lived while training, uh, what was it like behind the lines in the headquarters. Uh, they'll get some demonstrations uh, on bayonet training, how to defend themselves. There'll be the trench routine in the, how the soldiers conducted themselves in the training, uh, in the trenches or during the actual fighting. Uh, there are some temporary exhibits. Uh, Today we have a private collector uh, who wants to remain anonymous, has a beautiful collection of World War I German firearms. And it's a welcome addition to what's on this side. You know, we have a nice collection of Canadian military, but it's nice to see what the enemy used. And he brought it out today. And there's also a special exhibit on the paper war we call it uh, papers, documents, posters of uh, uh, Canada in the First World War. So there's sheet music, there's letters, there's diaries on exhibit today. Plus there's also the museum in the basement where we have a gentleman who came all the way from Saskatchewan, from Re Regina Military Museum uh, to uh, manage the museum in the basement. Well, as they told you over there, we're the bad guys. We don't think we are. We're pretty nice, actually. Um, once you get to know us. Once you get to know us, <laughs> we have good beer. Um, no, we are the, uh, we're the, we're the Germans, and what we're representing here is basically uh, a German machine gun position, late 1918. When people think of World War I, they think of the deep trenches, the deep bunkers and stuff. There was all that, but early in the war, the time period that we represent, which is from like August 1918 until the armistice, the German army was basically in retreat. And the, the trenches had basically devolved into kind of like what you see here. You have a slit trench, some very light cover. You wouldn't have shoulder to shoulder groups of soldiers with rifles. It was more a case of you would have a machine gun with a handful of soldiers guarding a machine gun, crewing that will everybody else continue to fall back. We joke that the reason that they have nicer entrenchments and bunkers over there is because we built them and they took them from us. Um, but that's basically what it is. The, the unit we represent is we're the 75th Infantry Regiment, which is a, an infantry regiment that was based in northern Germany, the area of Bremen Hamburg, way up north. And we're part of a reenacting group that's been in existence for about, about 12 years now. Mike and I come up from uh, West Fargo, North Dakota every year, but we have members scattered throughout the Midwest. We were supposed to have five here today, but a couple of them had issues with border issues and such. So you're stuck with just the two of us, but uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, though. If any questions about weapons, tactics, uniforms, gear, yes, the uniforms are wool, they're hot. Um, yes, the gas masks are hard to see. Good weight loss plan. You Fire away, though. I mean, that's that's kind of. Question about the helmets? Yes, sir. So, so I've seen helmets like that from uh, German or Second World War, mm -hmm. and I've also seen from First World War where they had the spikes on the German helmet. Correct. Um, I, and I brought one of those out. So this is what's called a pickle Um This is what the Germans wore at the start of the First World War. They're useless. They're boiled leather and they have absolutely no protection at all. The spike is strictly ornamental and it just represented the infantry. The idea was behind it, behind it was just the spears of, you know, the old Roman legions when they would march. That was the idea, to look like the Roman legions going past. Infantry had a spike, artillery had a little cannonball on top to show they were in, the, they were the artillery. And also for safety reasons, because if you had a bunch of guys, you know, working around a, a cannon, you don't want them bumping into each other with a spike. But these went, uh, these went by the wayside around 1916 because they were just useless. There was so many head injuries, this provided no protection. Because you have to remember it on a battlefield, there's not just bullets, there's shell fragments, there's rocks, there's pieces of dirt, there's timber falling down on you and stuff. There was a lot of people that were getting hurt on all sides, getting heavy head injuries. And the French were the first ones to actually come up with the idea of a steel helmet. And the story, is, as I understand it, is that there was a French general, his last name was, was Adrian, General Adrian. He was touring a hospital, look, talking to the wounded. And at that time, the French only wore like a cloth cap. 
and he noticed that there was all these head injuries and he started thinking like, how can I do something? Like, how can we do something about all these head injuries? And he was talking to some of the soldiers there. They said that what they would do is they would take their metal soup bowl and put it on their head and pull their cap down over it. And so General Adrian came up with the idea of like, let's come up with some kind of a metal helmet. And the French started doing it. The Commonwealth troops, the English, Canadians, Australians, and such, they adopted their version of the, their helmets over there are based on, I believe it's 13th century English pikemen's helmets. I, I'm not going to comment on their, effect, on their effectiveness or what I think of them. Um, <laughs> and then the Germans came out with these, um, which weigh about two and a half, this one's originally, weigh about two and a half pounds. And they're hot and they're heavy, but they provide pretty good protection. And then the Second World War helmets, um, they're the same basic shape, but they are just streamlined a lot more. Um, Must be that good design, though, that they would go into the Second World War. I think that the reason that they liked it was it kept the rain off the backs of their necks. And I'm, I'm not actually, I'm, I'm not being funny about that. I mean, I mean, that's legitimately accounts that I've read as why the helmet was so popular, was it kept the rain from running down the backs of their, their collars. And that's why they kind of liked this style of helmet. Um, the lugs on the front here, people ask about these, and these were, what the lugs were for, the Germans came out with a thing called a Sternpanzer, which was, it was a seven pound piece of metal that they would put across the front. So imagine a seven pound chunk of metal sitting right here, and then it would clip onto these, and it would go down. And obviously it wasn't for wearing the whole time, it was for wearing guys that were on sentry duty, uh, snipers, things like that. Anybody that had to put their head above a trench for a few minutes, they'd clip that on and then they would have some extra armor across their forehead. Because these won't stop a rifle bullet. They'll stop, they'll stop shell splinters and such, but I have original ones in my collection at home that have holes blown all the way through them from, from bullets and stuff. So, um. how, how, would, how did the Germans uh, fear um, with adapting to trench work, like like living in the trenches compared to the Allies? Um, I don't know how, it, how they would go compared actually to the Allies, but it's my understanding that they took pretty well to it. Um, the Germans, early in the war, they had bunkers as deep as 40 feet. They could, they could dig down. What they would actually do is they had, there were parts of Germany, uh, primarily in Silesia, which is now part of Poland, where they had a lot of coal mines. And so they would have these guys that were in their army that were professional coal miners for a living, and they would basically turn them into engineers building trenches. And so they knew how to like get way down there. And they would have, they had, like I said, 30, 40 foot deep bunkers that had electric lights. They had wood paneling, they had carpeting, they had heating. Um, they knew how to make them very comfortable. The Allies on the other hand, they believe more in mobile warfare. So a lot of their trench systems were very temporary. It was just very quickly because like, well, we're not going to be here very long. We're going to keep moving. And then unfortunately, it's like, okay, well, they stopped us with their machine guns. We're going to be here for a while. Let's start digging in now. Um, so they took a little bit longer to adapt to it. So how did the, how did the Germans decide the strategy that they were going to stay for quite a while in the trench? Um, do you mean like how they would, that they, they were, they were going to settle in or? The other guys, the other guys figure they're going to be temporary mm -hmm. move around. The Germans said, no, we're going to be here for a while. We'll, we'll build an elaborate trench. How did, how did that idea, how did that thinking originate? That I really don't know. I think it's just because it, it kind of turned into a stalemate. Yeah. And the Germans, I think, realized faster that they were in it yeah. for the long haul. Yeah, for the long haul. And I think they realized, too, like the Germans placed a lot more emphasis on their machine guns, even from early in the war. Yeah. And I think it was a case like, okay, we're here. We're probably not going anywhere. Let's get comfortable. Let's dig in the machine guns. Let's call in the guys that know how to coal mine. And as long as we're here, let's get comfortable um, because we're not going anywhere for a while. Where, where would they use the big Bertha artillery? Where, where would that would that be? Just sort of like major battles or the the big Bertha? Yeah, way in the back. Way in the back. It was my understanding that they used the big Bertha. They shelled Paris with it. Okay. I think I want to say about. 70, 75 rounds hit Paris over the course of, was it a year or so that Big yeah. Bertha was operating? It was on rails, right? It was on a rail, rail gun, yes, sir. Yep. And it took, I don't even know how many, I think it took over 100 guys actually to crew it. Yeah. Something like that. It was just a massive. You know, engineers yeah. building the tracks, everything under the sun. Yeah. Was the Was the Western Front largely made up of 
Germans? Or uh, did, was there Austrians and Hungary, Hungarians there too? Or did the Austrian-Hungarians go to fight Russia more? Well, you had um, the Asanzo Front. There were, there were some Austrian units that were down farther in the south. But yeah, the Austrians, um, the Austro-Hungarian troops were, they were mainly fighting the Italians on the, um, on the Asanzo Front down in uh, the Adriatic, which is now like north, uh, northeastern Italy in that area. And then you had the Austro-Hungarians. There were some of them on the uh, on the Russian front too. So it was it was predominantly Germans on the Western Front. Yeah. Were the uniforms different from summer to winter? No, sir. No? It was this all year round. Oh, yeah. The officers, because the officers had privilege and money and everything, they could have cotton uniforms made and stuff like that. But your average soldier, like Mike or I, we'd be issued this and wearing this all year round. It's heavy wool. Right now it's hot, um, but in the winter time, the nice thing about wool is it's very durable and it stays warm when it's wet. So <clears throat> with the climate in Northern Europe being what it is, yeah, it's uncomfortable now, but give it a couple months and it'll be, it'll be nice and warm, it'll be nice and comfortable. Was the, was the, the Kaiser's troops um, very young like ours? 18 to 22? Well, the way that the Germans did it, they had a reserve system, and it was um, the way it started out when you were 20 years old, you served for two years, and then in the active army, and then from there, I believe you went into the reserves for, I think it was, was it six years, I think, in the reserves, and then you went into the Landwehr, and then you went into the Landsturm, and there were varying divisions of the military and it was based on your age so like you'd have the Landsturm guys were guys they were in their late 30s early 40s they generally did stuff like <coughs> excuse me they generally did stuff like guarding prisoners of war camp guarding railroads things like that whereas you would have the guys that were regular army and reserve would be up doing most of the fighting <coughs> excuse me later on in the war um the draft ages did get reduced and there were um especially towards the end of the war, there were soldiers as young as 14 that were serving in the front lines. I've got photographs in my collection that were taken, you know, very late in the war, and you, of, you know, German soldiers in their training camps, they're, and you look at them, they're a bunch of kids. I mean, some of them look like they're that tall, and even some of the original stuff that we find in our collections, caps and things like that, they're, they're tiny. I mean, they're just for, for small kids, basically, because they were, at the end, they were grabbing everybody they could they were grabbing little kid you know young boys they were grabbing old men that were in their 60s and just giving them a rifle and pushing them to the front